Uh, so welcome to those in the room and online uh, to the speaker program of the US Asia Law Institute at NYU School of Law. I am Catherine Wilhelm, executive director of the Institute. And this is our regular speaker program where we host people to talk about topics in Asian law and in international law as it applies in Asia. Our speaker today is NYU Global Professor of Law, Angela Zhang. Uh, in the past few years, she has become uh, one of the go-to people when questions are asked about China's regulation of its high-tech sector. Uh, she is normally based at the University of Hong Kong, uh, and we've had her as a guest in our speaker program before, but it's always been on Zoom. So we're very happy now to be able to have her in person with us, not just today, but for the whole semester. Professor Zhang is probably best known for her book on Chinese antitrust, which was published uh, two years ago, called uh, Chinese Antitrust Exceptionalism, How the Rise of China Challenges Global Regulation. But since publishing that book, she's been focusing on uh, Chinese AI, and a new book is going to appear in the spring, and we'll have her back then to talk about that. Her talk today, of course, is called The Paradox of Chinese AI Regulation, Too Little and Too Much, not or too much, with a question uh, that she adds. We're also honored today to have Professor uh, Benedict Kingsbury as moderator. He is the faculty director of the Guarini Institute for Global Legal Studies and the Global Law and Tech Initiative, which is a co-sponsor of our talk today. And uh, he's an expert on the subject of mega regulation, which is a combination of national and transnational regulation that has been a byproduct of globalization. So with that, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Professor Kingsbury to say a few words. Very few. Uh, I'm also vice dean for global programs here at the law school and uh in that capacity i just wanted to say how delighted we are to have Professor jung here for this uh, semester she's a vibrant and kind of wonderful addition both through our curriculum she's uh co-teaching the guarini colloquium on uh, regulation of global digital corporations and brings the whole extra perspective to that uh and she's also teaching uh about the way in which chinese uh law uh, has transnational implications in the global economy uh, more and more. So she's really enriching our curriculum and also she's a very energetic participant in lots of activities here, uh, including in our Guarini Global Law and Tech. So welcome, Angela, and we look forward to this. Thank you. You know, I am very excited um, about today's presentation because we at academic, we spend a lot of time studying and researching and you know, this is the time we launch our product, you know, <laughs> in the high tech industry. Um, and um, so it's a very exciting moment for me. I mean, I, this this talk today is based on a paper I haven't finished. And so it's very much a work in progress, but I want to show you what I have so far. And I, I, I have to say that it's quite interesting. Uh, <laughs> um, Oh, but before before that, I want to say a few words. Um, I I uh, I want to thank Catherine, uh, for proposing the uh, this event, and thank you for offering me the deal to come back to uh, do my book launch next semester. Done deal, okay. And um, I want to thank Thomas for uh organize co organizing it and for uh the Giolini Center for co sponsoring it. Um, I also want to mention that back in April, I participated in a Giolini Center's. Uh, conference on how to regulate and how not to regulate ChatGPT. It was a it's a wonderful conference. So for those of you who are very interested in AI, I highly recommend you go back to the YouTube channel uh, of NYU where you can check out the whole conference. And Benedict was there. You were wearing a very nice cap at that time. You didn't today. Um. So today's uh, focus is on China, and um, as those of you know, you know China has become very active in the past few years in AI regulation. It's been the first jurisdiction to turn out some of the um, uh, earliest um, uh, a comprehensive AI regulations. Um, China is the first to introduce uh, uh, rules to regulate algorithm, a very comprehensive rule to regulate algorithm uh, back in 2021. And, and, and then 
Just last year, uh, China published rules to regulate deepfake technology. And when ChatGPT emerged, the Chinese agencies also reacted very quickly. So in February uh, this year, um, uh, China's Chinese anti uh, Chinese state authority actually um, rec uh, mandates um, the uh, Alibaba and uh, actually actually Tencent and Ant Group uh, to uh, not to uh, in integrate uh, ChatGPT services into their ecosystem. And uh, a month later, we saw that Apple was instructed to remove over a hundred ChatGPT like apps in China. And in April, um, China was the first uh, jurisdiction, major jurisdiction to introduce uh, rules uh, to regulate generative AI. And the first draft of the rule was proposed by the Cyberspace Administration of China. It laid out very strict uh, requirements such as, you know, not just adherence to the socialist value, but also requirements uh, asking those content generated must be true and accurate. As we all know, it's a task almost impossible and also, you know, very demanding um, requirement on the foundation developers that they need to recalibrate their model uh, if, you know, something, uh, if it is found to generate illegal content and they have to do that within three months. And as you know, you know, training a large language foundation model is very expensive. And then this constant tweaking of the, the model will impose very significant burden on the developers. And so that all leads to the impression and um, there is a prevailing um, impression among the industry and also among the uh, you know policy around that they think that you know AI regulation is going to be a big stumbling block for uh, Chinese uh, AI companies. And I was probably the only one, a very I mean at least one of the very few lonely voices out there at that time that disagree with the prevailing view. So I published an op-ed back in May, um, right after the draft rule published, that I predict that um, you know the CAC's uh, first version of the laws will be watered down. And I specifically advanced three arguments, which I call the three C uh, uh, models. Um, one is contacts, cloud, and then clouds and competition. Contact by contacts, I mean, I refer to the institutional contacts in China. Look, you can't just look at the law as it is. You need to look at the contacts, right? I mean, where China really value the development of AI, which is vital for economic growth, but they also matter hugely for national pride. If you think about China's current tech race uh, with the United States, and then we also need to look at the cloud, right? I mean, cyberspace administration of China is a very powerful organization it possess significant cloud but nonetheless you know it's clouds still constrained right it's bureaucratic cloud is not omnipotent and and it, it only possess limited uh legal cloud and we also need to look at the cloud possessed by the the firms these ai companies over the years has forged a very strong alliance with the government uh with uh various government departments with uh, universities, which they can leverage um, to uh, lobby against very strict rules. And lastly, I think most importantly is competition. And by competition, I do not mean business competition. I mean agency rivalry, because as we know, you know, Chinese, there's a lot of uh, government departments in China that have, uh, you know, regulatory functions over AI. And particularly there is Ministry of in Industry Information Technology, uh, there is Ministry of Science and Technology, National Development Reform Commission. All these agencies have very strong vested interests to promote the development of AI. So I predict that these agencies will form very, uh, you know, formidable countervailing uh, forces uh, against very stringent regulation proposed by the CAC. And I am right. So when the law was proposed, um, uh, was finalized in July uh, this year, China, you see the, the final law significant, significantly watered down um, the provisions that was proposed in the earlier version. And, and, and also some of the very strict rules were removed. And besides, they also incorporate some very friendly uh, provisions uh, into the law, such as advocating a very tolerant and cautious approach in regulating uh, AI. 
And in today's talk, I am going to use my crystal ball again, and I want to make another prediction that China is not, we should not see the Chinese AI regulation or the interim measure that was finalized in July as um, kind of like a restricted measures. Rather, we should see it as enabler, um, that in the sense that Chinese re regulation actually is going to give a helping hand um, to Chinese tech firms. So I will use the rest of the time to explain, and you can tell me whether you are convinced or not. I will start by explaining why um, the Chinese regulation will work as an enabler rather than an impediment for Chinese AI uh, development, which is very rare. You don't see regulation as an enabler in, in, uh, in any jurisdiction so far. And, um, and then I will explain China's innovation strategy and how law function as one level of control uh, in China's uh, innovation playbook. And then we will look beyond China and conduct some comparative assessment with what's happening in the United States and Europe. And obviously there's a lot going on these days. Um, and finally draw some implications before opening up uh, the floor uh, for questions. Um, so let's first start with the very fundamental. What does law do, okay? Um, so in the, the, in the book uh, published in 2008, Professor Curtis Milha, which who now uh, teaches Stanford and Katharina Pista, who uh, teach Uptown, <laughs> in up school Uptown. And um, they have a, a very good book called Law and Capitalism. They propose uh, the four basic functions of law, right? I mean, traditionally, if you think about what law does, it allocates rights to individuals, right? I mean, give you property rights so you can enjoy other people from infringing your rights. And that's the very basic concepts of what law does. But at the same time, you know, a lot of market transactions require coordination among interested parties. So um, uh, Mohan and uh, Pista also propose, you know, law also function as a coordination device to facilitate transactions. And also law has information value. It can send signal to the market participants as to how, what will be the enforcement priority of the law and um, you know, how, how agencies going to do about things. And so it also sends strong signal to, has a signaling value. And lastly, law also enhance the credibility of the enforcers because it kind of commit enforcers to uh, the specific rules. And Professor Richard Adam also proposed something similar in the sense that he, uh, in his very, uh, except like a really well-recognized work called the expressive power of the law, he proposed that, look, um, people obey the law, not just because they are afraid of the sanctions or because what Professor Tom Tyler, who used to teach here said, you know, people obey the law because they think it's a legitimate, right? Because of just due process. But beyond that, he thinks that um, people obey the law because the, of its expressive power to begin with, right? I mean, so law kind of function as a focal point to borrow the concept from Thomas Schelling. He built, built his work uh, upon the, the game theory of Thomas Schelling um, that law kind of become a focal point, a coordination device for a salient point for people to coordinate their actions. So law has this expressive power to coordinate and besides, law has information value, right? I mean, this is similar to what uh, Milha and Pista mentioned. So in, this, in my article, I try to argue that the interim measure that you see China's AI regulation mostly serve two functions. First is signaling and the other is coordination. I don't think the law has too much protective value in a sense it doesn't allocate much rights to individuals because if you think about it, you look at the law closely, it doesn't create any new rights here. It's just mostly piggyback on existing law you know, IP rights, competition law, data privacy, you know, it's referring back to the existing law. It's not creating uh, any new protections uh, to individuals, right? So the protective value is heavily discounted. And because it is an interim measure, I mean, which signal that the agencies might change its stance, you know, later on down the road. And also this is a law that is promulgated by ministries at the ministry level, right? So there's a departmental guideline that is of relatively low uh, legal hierarchy rather than pr promulgated by a national uh, uh, body like uh, the national legislature. So um, it's on a legal hierarchy level, it's relatively low. So the commitment value is also very low. So instead, I see the law plays two functions. One is signaling and one is coordination. And these actually 
uh, serve very powerful instruments to enable the development of AI. Now, on the surface, if you read the law, it looks very broad and comprehensive. And in fact, some of the provisions mirror what you see in other jurisdictions, such as the EU, where um, it, it requires and mandates the service providers to do a lot of things, you know, make sure you the content generated uh, need to fulfill a range of uh, standards and and um, you know the data uh, need to uh, uh, need to comply with a range of obligations, right? In in data privacy, in uh, in IP, cannot infringe IP rights, um, cannot discriminate, and um, cannot uh, you know generate other liabilities, basically, right? So it's very broad on the surface, but when you look closely, okay, you will see it's actually it's very narrow, because the law has a very big carve out. It only applies to those firms that provide publicly facing services. So to the extent that your company is only providing services to the enterprises in-house or to a university, right? I mean, or you're doing internal research, this law doesn't apply to you. Okay, so so even though you know you look at it, it's, it's a very broad, uh, broad provisions, but it has a very narrow focus, very targeted. And besides, now, if you think you you are a sub AI entrepreneur thinking about launching a product, what you are most worried about is license requirements because that's the requirement that you need to fulfill. Well, oh, in our legal jargon, this is the ex ante requirement that you need to fulfill before you launch the product into the market, and that's the single most important thing that you worry about, right? I mean, um, and the only requirement, ex ante requirement that is found in this interim measure is the content regulation requirement. So to the extent that you are providing services to the public, plus these services have public opinion uh, properties, right? You can potentially influence public opinion, then you need to go to the CAC to obtain a license. Everything else fall within the pre-existing law. In other words, there's not much new there. The only thing new here is this license requirement. I'm slightly exaggerating, but basically, you know, if you want me to summarize what's being there, you know, if I'm an entrepreneur, I look at this, okay, okay, I need to get the license from CAC if I want to do this kind of service. But other than that, you know, I'm okay, right? And and why does that, right? I mean, if you think about what the CAC does, this agency traditionally has been in charge. It was established to in, to manage content in China, online content, right? I mean, so its primary bureaucratic mission is information control and or censorship, right? I mean, so, um, and if you look back at, at all this regulation that it, it proposed in the past couple of years, it always bore very strong, uh, you know, properties in, you know, uh, uh, requirements uh, with content regulation. And in fact, this, uh, security assessment, this license requirement that is uh, mandated in interim measure actually goes back to 2018 when um, the CRC for the first time introduced security assessment for uh, online platforms that can move public opinions. So it started from there. And, um, and then you can find similar requirements uh, later on when the agency require uh, companies to um, to file algorithm, register their algorithm. Similarly, they only require those that review public opinions to do that. And um, and for the deep fake regulation, it was a similar requirement that um, they need to do the online content moderation. So this sends a very strong signal that for for companies doing AI services in China, the first and foremost they need to worry about is does your product have you know potentially can view public opinions then you need to fulfill this licensing standard and everything else just fall within pre-existing law and it's a liberation signal okay because because as soon as the law came out people feel a sign of relief because this is a time i feel certain right because before it was cloudy i just don't know you know what are the requirements but it's it was a sign of relief that in only three months the cac you know, remove all this uncertainty. So we know exactly sure what we need to do when we 
device, our products? What should be our strategy? What kind of services I should launch to the Chinese market or go overseas or do a whatever, right? I mean, so it's a great form of relief. It's a liberating signal to the industry. And the regulatory burden is not that heavy, particularly considering a lot of the biggest players in China doing AI are the big tech companies, right? The other important signal, uh, the other important function served by this interim measure, which tends to be overlooked, is the coronation function. Um, and in the final version, they incorporated a few other provisions that is not found in the earlier draft, Article 5, Article 6, Article 16, which called for the coordination among a variety of participants in the AI supply chain, including the regulators, the industry participants, inputs, the essential inputs into AI, data and computer resources, and standard setting. And I will talk about this one by one, okay? And this kind of uh, coordination approach kind of mirror, if you pay attention to, you know, this commentary on the US-China tech war, you kind of mirror what China is now doing with the whole of society approach to mobilize all resources in China in this context with the United States with the tech race. So um, so it's you can so this small guidelines on AI regulation is in itself a reflection of the broader national uh, strategy in terms of regulation. So let's start with this four levels of coordination. First is the bureaucracy. As we just talked about, you know, China has many government departments in charge of AI. And the first draft of the rule was proposed by one single agency, the Cyber Space Administration of China, which has been in charge of um, the internet uh, content control, okay? But the, the, the final version release was jointly promulgated by seven central ministries, all of which have some regulatory functions on AI. And in fact, you know, all your policy documents call for even 15, um, you know, agencies uh, that coordinate in AI uh, policies. Um, so but in any event, these are the core agencies in charge, and that's why they, their names are on the book. And there's specific provision calling for the coordination among those agencies, right? I mean, so despite the fact that we don't see the kind of Western style of checks and balance where the, judge, the ju judiciary uh, impose a very strict and very uh, kind of counterbalance against the, the company uh, that the agencies, right? I mean, provides this kind of checks and balance. But in China, you have an alternative form of checks and balance in the sense that you have fragmentation within the bureaucracy because each of them are in charge of different functions and the last functions could be potentially conflicting with each other. As we I, I, I mentioned earlier, some of the ministries are actually in favor of developing um, the AI technology, right? I mean, so they will be uh, against, uh, averse to uh, very strict regulation. So this form an, a, an internal form of alternative form, or you call it Chinese style of checks and balance, okay? Um, the law also uh, called for the coordination among um, uh, industry participants. But those of you who are familiar with uh, innovation strategy, we know that almost all the innovations, um, most important, particularly the largest scale, uh, high quality technology, require close coordination among. Okay. Okay. So, require coordination amongst um, close coordination between the university industry, government, and um, and then also the industry alliance play a very important intermediary and con role in becoming a conduit and facilitate those co cooperation. Now, one prime example, you, if you look at all the biggest uh, AI labs that uh, produce a large language models, all, all, many of them uh, are created uh, using this model, right? I mean, one example, um, is uh, the Beijing Academy of Artificial Intelligence, uh, which is um, the, the first organization uh, to produce the, 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 the large language model uh, in China. And, um, and this, this organization is made public and it's uh, heavily sponsored by the Beijing government, the Beijing Communist Party, um, the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology, and, and, and got, you know, amazing support from many universities, collaborated with many universities like Tsinghua um, and Peking University and Renmin University. So it's all the talents from all the major universities in China. Now, uh, as we know, data um, is essential input 
onto um, the AI system. And um, the law also calls for the coordination of data resources. And, um, and when it comes to data, it used to be a big advantage um, for um, the Chinese um, AI companies, particularly if you think about the facial recognition technology where the Chinese government has access to vast amount of uh, personal data. But when it comes to um, training Chat GPT, um, the China's data resources so when it comes to training the chat GPT, the China data resource is actually not very good because um, China does not have them in the open source database. And um, so, and, and the Chinese language database, the quality is not very good. And also partly because of the censorship um, requirements. So, um, so that actually creates a dearth of the data resources, good quality data resources for the Chinese farms to train the AI models. And that also explains why the government is now urging alliance. Here I show the picture of, you know, organization joining this kind of data resource alliance uh, in order to create more data resources for these AI companies. Another important input into AI is computer computing power, right? I mean, China is facing very strong regulatory headwinds from the United States. So farms have difficulty accessing very uh, high-end uh, chips uh, from NVIDIA. And Chinese government has tried various things, right? I mean, China has doubled down on its semiconductor, um, but it hasn't achieved too much progress so far. Um, and China is also coordinating their own computer uh, resources in order to more efficiently use computing power. So you, in the past couple of years, you have seen this kind of computing center proliferated all over China. And just late last year, China proposed um, uh, this new plan called Eastern Data Western Computing because in the West, uh, the energy power and uh, utility uh, cost is cheaper. So China proposed, you know, establish large scale uh, data and computing um, uh, center in the West um, so that they can more efficiently um, and train and use computer resources. And this is also mentioned in the law. And last but not the least is coordinate uh, standard setting, right? There is a saying in the Chinese industry that first uh, third tier companies make products, second tier companies make technology and top tier companies set standards. And um, so China has been very active in um, uh, engaging with the standard setting organization like the ISO, IEC, and the United Nations. But um, China's engagement with AI um, standard is still uh, limited, right? Unlike the 5G, right? I mean, where Huawei got a lot of standard essential patterns um, because uh, a lot of the uh, AI standard setting uh, are kind of bodies are embedded in the traditional uh, large uh, uh, multi uh, transnational organization, if you think about the G7, G20, OECD, to which China is excluded. So China is not part of the game to, you know, a large number of the standard essential uh, setting bodies. Um, so um, so that's also explained, you know, the why the law encouraged China to have more international cooperation and to be more active in standard setting. So basically you can see, you know, these four levels of coordination that was uh, promoted by the law kind of set the blueprint of China's um, innovation strategy into AI. And, and why does that? Because China has been predicted to be the country that will benefit the most from AI. I mean, this is a research from PwC that predict that China will be the country um, that can benefit its uh, GDP will, will grow by almost 26% um, uh, from AI because China is traditionally a, a, a manufacturing country. So a manufacturing expected to uh, increase, AI is expected to increase the productivity of uh, a manufacturing. That's why China will benefit a great deal. So it matters hugely for China's future economic growth. And back in 2017, the state council has already laid down the vision for China. AI development, right? I mean, by 2020, China want to catch up to the most advanced AI power. I think to the largest thing, China I think China fulfilled that. And by 2025, China wants to become one of the world's leaders in AI. And we are, I think we are almost there. Um, but the last one, by 2030, achieving primacy in AI, I think is an ambitious goal. Because if you look at what China has achieved so far, um, 
you know, United States um, would perceive China as a full-fledged rivalry when it comes to both uh, commercial application and the national application, uh, national security application of AI. But China have excelled so far in only a very small limited sectors like facial recognition, voice recognition, AI enabled drones, but everything else America leads far ahead. And particularly with the rival to check GPT, um, you know, that was kind of shocked the whole industry. And then now uh, a lot of the observers believe that China about two or three years behind the United States. So China has a very strong urge to catch up. I mean, this matter hugely uh, for its economic growth, for its capital, uh, for its um, uh, national image. And um, and um, we should, and I propose in my work that we should look at China's innovation strategy as four levels of control, where law is actually only one component, and actually it's the last <laughs> component. So Chinese government is a policymaker, is an investor, is an influencer in the supply chain, and lastly, a regulator. So start with policy. So Chinese government at both the central and local level it have promulgated numerous rules and regulation to uh, promote AI development, to facilitate uh, AI uh, data resources, a, a lot of rules um, uh, that facilitate uh, AI uh, 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 industry, uh, the development in China. And besides, China is heavily invested um, in AI, right? The government uh, have poured billions of dollars into the industry, either through direct funding allocation to those research projects or to those companies or through subsidies or through those government guidance funds. I don't know how much, how many of you are, have heard of government guidance funds now have played a very prominent role in um, facilitating growth of Chinese uh, startups in critical industries like AI, like in semiconductors. So normally the government put in a small, num a small amount of money and then um, it, and then other state-owned firms or private companies would then join in the government fund and then jointly contribute to the startup. So, and we have seen, you know, more and more these government funds and actually some of the cities in China and Shenzhen are particularly ambitious and aggressive in, in proposing that. So China is heavily uh, invested um, in the AI sector as well. And third, China is um, a both a supplier, a, a distributor, and a customer of a lot of AI products, right? I mean, by supplier, uh, one of the crucial inputs into AI is data, right? I mean, and China, Chinese government is a very important supply of data to AI products. Um, go back to the the uh, example about facial recognition, right? I mean, companies like SenseTime, a lot of the other uh, uh, big major AI firms that have been successful in China all benefit very, from very close collaboration with the Chinese government. And there is a, a, a few very, uh, a number of very influential work by uh, David Young from Harvard, uh, Harvard, Harvard University's Econ Department, along with his co-author, he published a few paper on how the Chinese government's procurement of those AI products, particularly related to public security, has facilitated growth of China's AI industry. Because the more government contracts that you have, the more access that you have to the government data, which help you better train your AI product, which can it, in turn help you know propel the development of commercial application of those products. So, um, so there's a number of works that you know just demonstrate you know how important China is as a supplier um, to those firms, and Chinese government is also a very important customer, right? I mean, they buy a lot of the. The, the 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 public security products um you know the smart city initiative i don't know where you heard of that um you know it's also consuming a lot of the uh, uh, ai uh, related products the chinese government also could provide incubator uh for uh, ai startups um so offering very generous deals uh to incubate um and those um and uh, to, to provide, you know, good, uh, fertile environment to grow the industry, right? I mean, so it, it's it's not an overstatement to say, you know, this the government is like going all in um, and very heavily invested um, in, in the sector. And regulation is only one level of control, right? Because if you think about it, you know, all the three levers that we just talked about all facilitate growth, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's aimed at growing the market. And regulation is kind of like the countervailing force to some extent, you know, when growth happens, it tends to lead to chaos. And then so the government to, 
at a certain age, we need to decide when I intervene and to reduce the chaos because when the chaos grow too big, it becomes lead to crisis that can threaten the social and political civility. Um, and one example I want to draw is the facial recognition technology. And um, for those of students who come from China, you know the camera is now everywhere in China, in both public settings and commercial settings. And um, and and this kind of this has led to a strong backlash among the Chinese public because they don't feel secure. They feel they have been over monitor and they are a growing concern about data leaks, uh, about privacy, right? I mean, so we, there have been, you know, growing uh, complaints and um, concern about this abusive use of AI technology in China. But despite this uh, prevailing uh, concern, um, so far the regulation has been uh, relatively light touch. Okay, so so far China does not have have not uh, had any comprehensive rules to regulate uh, facial recognition technology. You know, if Chinese government want to do that, they can do it tomorrow, right? And um, rather, the rules are kind of piecemeal and indirect. I mean, they don't directly address facial recognition. You can find scattered rules in uh, criminal law, consumer protection law, data privacy law, personal information protection law, civil civil code. You can find them. You know, you can potentially apply them, but all of them are indirect and kind of piecemeal. There's a Supreme People's Court uh, judicial interpretation, but it's still it's very broad and very limited in scope. Um, some standard setting bodies have proposed some soft rules um, to soft law standard setting rules. Uh, but, you know, because they are soft laws, they they are, um, um, so their influence is very, very limited, right? I mean, it's, it depends on firms' voluntary compliance. And occasionally, people do challenge um, the use of, abusive use of AI technology. There was a famous case where a law professor in Hangzhou um, kind of want to be the shram in China. And, um, and he challenged the Hangzhou Zoo for uh, mandating him to use uh, the facial recognition uh, to uh, enter the zoo. And the court actually uh, ruled in favor of him, but came, came down with a very limited ruling because he only requested the zoo to delete his, his data, his personal data, but did not mandate the rule to abandon the use of the facial recognition technology. So you can see, you know, the court is trying to balance both at the one time. On the one hand, it wants to satisfy the plaintiff's request because it seems perfectly legitimate. But on the other hand, it doesn't want to be a policymaker and doesn't want to start, you know, a massive a president where everywhere is challenging um, and this kind of uh, facial recognition technology. And starting from 2021, uh, we start an uptake of administrative enforcement against um, the AI, uh, the, the use of uh, facial recognition. Um, and in various cities, um, we see uh, a lot of the, um, the small fines here and there, uh, but all these fines are very small. And even when, you know, in involving cases um, where, you know, hundreds of thousands of biometric data were illegally uh, obtained and harvested, um, the fine is still very minimal. Considering, you know, the discretion that they have, you know, and, and, the, and the legal sanction that they can potentially in, uh, introduce after the personal information protection law uh, uh, was implemented. Uh, but uh, in August uh, this year, China finally uh, introduce um, a, uh, a draft rules on facial recognition. And um, now the, the rule hasn't become effect yet, uh, ha hasn't gone effective yet, right? I mean, still a long way to go before we start to see a lot of enforcement and still a lot of uncertainty how things, uh, will, how this will be implemented. But you can see basically this kind of regulatory cycle of a new technology in China, right? I mean, the government was very cautious and very tolerant of this technology and only slowly starting to uh, roll out uh, regulations uh, very gradually. So I'm predicting that the government is going to do the same with ChatGPT like services uh, or other generative AI services. Now let's uh, look beyond China and broaden horizon to look at how other jurisdictions are also regulating AI. And this is based on the Stanford uh, AI index, uh, where you see, you know, just last year, you know, there are 37 uh, laws that promulgated globally on AI. But when we compare different jurisdictions on AI regulation, we shouldn't just look at just the 
those laws called AI laws. Because if you are a legal counsel working at a, a large tech firm, right? I mean, there are you are subject to your your company is subject to all sorts of law that can apply to your AI products, right? I mean, so uh, there are laws that have AI specific law. If you think about the EU's AI Act, China's generative AI rules, right? I mean, these are the AI specific law. But there are also laws that uh, contains provisions uh, relating to AI. Think about the GDPR, where, which has specific provisions that regulate AI, and um, and uh, you know, Digital Service Act, uh, which is very going to be a very powerful legislation that will uh, uh, regulate AI in EU. Right? I mean, so there are AI-related laws. And by the way, you know, the AI services are now subject to challenge under a wide range of traditional law. Think about intellectual property law. Think about torts law. Think about labor uh, employment law. Um, you know, so so there's whole spectrum of rules that we are comparing here. We cannot just focus very narrowly uh, on the AI specific law. And if we look at a very broad scope, basically, I see, you know, China kind of have a little bit comparative advantage here because in the EU, uh, we see, you know, back is when ChatGPT emerged, you know, a lot of national authorities have already uh, started to uh, raise uh, data uh, violation concern, right? I mean, back in April, um, the, the Italian authority have temp temp even temporarily suspend uh, OpenAI service in Italy um, for data process processing issues. And now OpenAI is under scrutiny by a, a, a slew of uh, European uh, data authorities. And uh, EU is, you know, it, EU had already have very stringent uh, data law, the GDPR, right? I mean, and the EU authority has not hesitated to brought very big fines against big tech companies based on its enforcement record in the past few years. And the Digital Service Act is going to be a very big overhand over these AI firms as well. Not to mention the AI Act, which EU is expected to introduce later this year, which is likely, I'm not saying with certain, it's likely to, to introduce a lot of the ex ante requirements, like so-called licensing requirements that would delay the launch of a lot of the AI products in Europe, right? I mean, so, um, I would say there's an overwhelming consensus that EU is the strictest and the most burdensome and cumbersome jurisdictions uh, for AI firms, whereas the United States and people tend to have the impression that it's very lax, it's very laid back. I mean, uh, there's not yet any comprehensive reg le legislation at the federal level, even though states have some uh, legislations, right? I mean, but uh, when you look closer, right? I mean, the United States has a very strong point of spar. Right. I mean, there have been at least 10 uh, copyright infringement lawsuits against OpenAI, Microsoft and all these big AI firms. And there's also defamation lawsuits, data privacy lawsuits, employment litigations, I mean, against these companies. So this is a part of the regulatory burden that we should not overlook when we compare uh, the, the compar competitive advantage among different jurisdictions. Now, China takes a dual approach. When it comes to content regulation, it's very strict um, and it imposes licensing requirements, but everything else regard to the AI infringement, potential AI infringement, it's all left to the exposed enforcement, right? I mean, still, we don't know exactly what they would do, but my prediction is that they're going to be very lenient because of you know the the overriding uh, initiative that they have learned from the law, which sent a you know unambiguous signal that they should encourage growth and to foster development in this area. That brings me back to the implication, which I think is the most important point, right? I mean, first, I believe um, law will function as a competitive strategy for the Chinese tech firms uh, who have great ambition uh, to make strides in this area. Um, it, to some extent, because the regulatory burden is lower, but law is not the decisive factor, right? I mean, it's not the only, it's not a sufficient condition uh, for, for growth. And also, you know, very lenient rules also come with a very, you know, come with byproducts, right? I mean, because if the law is so favorable to big businesses, it's, it's going to likely to entrench their monopoly because the biggest players, if you think about it, now uh, all the other existing uh, big tech incumbents, right? I mean, that have invested very heavily on AI and it will further entrench the monopolies at the same time. Um, it will um, also lead to a lot of inequality because if you, if, if you are an IP holder 
and um, your uh, property right is not properly protected because of this overriding government policy, right? I mean, it will in the long term discourage innovation and have uh, long term consequences for economic growth as well. Um, and because of China's strict regulation on public facing services, it also provides an incentive for Chinese farms to venture overseas, particularly if they want to provide public facing services, right? Because the market is global. So I'm expecting to see more and more Chinese companies to uh, AI firms, given the fact that they are very strong and they have strong capabilities, good talents, right? Deep pockets. This company will venture overseas and become successful when they go overseas, just like companies like TikTok, companies like Timu, how they conquer the US and European markets. But when they go overseas, their competitive edge, uh, we just mentioned, right? The, the law as a competitive edge kind of diluted because especially if they come to a jurisdiction like the EU, which is very strict, right? I mean, so they need to adapt to the, to the new law and the original competitive advantage is kind of diluted and they're unlikely to face legal challenge overseas. So we are going to anticipate uh, some legal conflicts uh, in the coming years. And lastly, I want to talk about global spill over effects because AI is a technology that's widely applied in all sorts of um, applications, like in hardware and software. And um, and um, and there is now a debate among the industry and uh, among the policy realm as to you know what could be the future consequences of AI, particularly considering AI could AI exter you know. Um, uh, exterminate people and then uh, and and the people are worried about um, the the worst case scenario of AI and if China adopt a very lax approach in regulating AI and this might give rise to concern uh, from the international community that um, the uh, inadequate protections uh, could lead to AI disasters right I mean and and that would could have uh, strong spill over effects over other jurisdictions. So I would like to conclude with a uh, suggestion and also something that I've been working on because of the concern of the global spill over effects, I strongly urge the rest of the global community to engage more closely with China because right now there's very little, very limited uh, international cooperation with China. So China's engagement with the, especially the, with the Western countries, the Western community in producing AI is very limited. So I do call for the international community to have more dialogue with, with China and to understand what China is doing, um, whether, you know, with Cassandra settings or with other sorts of forms of international cooperation. I think that's very important um, to for, for a bright and safe future for all of us. So I will stop here and then I welcome Benedict's comments. Uh, well, thank you very much. It's a uh, very stimulating presentation, and uh, it's, I think very helpful in in, in kind of sh shifting away from the orthodoxy of the way this thing is often presented in the U.S. So, uh, which is also really important. So one of the very nice things for us about having the global program is people to do that. So, uh, I'll make one or two comments, but I think a lot of people will want to make their own comments and questions uh, both on, online and uh, here. So. Uh, I, I think um, you ended in a place which I, I, I wonder if it should be a bit more worked into the presentation itself in, in the future, which is um, the, the, the question of how to manage risks in relation to AI. Of course, there's lots of different kinds of AI and different things. We haven't got into that separating out things yet. But uh, this, uh, Sam Altman and co, yes, they talk about regulation. I mean, the head of open AI, but... A lot of the discussion there is also about building in guardrails themselves. For a while, it was called ethics, uh, whatever that might mean exactly. But certainly some sensibility that the people developing these things and making them available and deploying them should themselves take responsibility for that. So separately from whether there's legal liability and uh, so forth, litigation risk. Um, and of, of course, the, the people doing this in China will be thinking on a lot of the same topics, many of them. On the other hand, uh, there's the, the, the kind of question, well, how does that relate to the uh, kind of internal culture of firms or research and, and in a competitive environment to make progress fast and so forth? And I understand that the Ministry of Science and Technology is now moving towards trying to institutionalize more widespread or regularized um, ethics committees of some sort or, or review systems, not really based on, I mean, there may be a law eventually or some sort of guideline for doing that, but 
based at core just on the internal process, of, uh, which happens in, say, in universities here doing biological research or human subject research or animals research, things like that, and the institutional review board. Uh, but it looks like there's an idea to include some of the uh, AI systems research uh, into that ethics arrangement and, and in a standardized way. And, and with tiers, there'll be, a, I think, a sort of in-house ethics review board and then some sort of expert one for people who really know a lot about it where you need it for a high risk thing, et cetera. So, 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 so I, th I think there's maybe a question to ask here. Is it right to separate law and regulation so strongly from these other kind of institutional forms of control and regularization of conduct and projection of things? And uh, how well will those those ethics boards work within com private companies, within SOEs, within research institutes, collaborations? Uh, uh, and will they, in fact, have a significant independent power? Will they be a big nuisance, actually? Will they be a drag on innovation? And what will be the effect of that? Or will they not be? So, so something along that track. I think that's probably the first uh, kind of comment or question I, I want to, to make. And the, uh, the second one, uh, I, I think, would go to this uh, issue of whether these all these um, the, the the image that being light on litigation uh, having only ex post facto controls of some sort but uh, really feeling relatively unconstrained as long as they stay within the kind of content oriented rules and so forth whether um, that really creates such a innovation advantage as you are suggesting. Uh, there after all, and uh, and how to really assess that what, what would be the kind of empirical study you know to what extent for example in the US which is has quite a lot of litigation including lots of ex post class actions of different sorts uh, all the kind of things you mentioned but that hasn't seemed to have inhibited very much the generative AI development of the US uh, and its deployment actually and the rapidity so so I, I, I wonder it might take a bit more to substantiate the idea that that there's a real advantage from the approach you summarized and the way that you implied there in China. They only, they, they, yes, they're different, but whether the difference makes a difference, I think might be something to explore some more. So so that's the two questions. I have some others, but I, I, uh, I, I and so would you like to answer any of that now or should we take some more questions first? Well, I, I, I can answer them now. Okay, perhaps you should come back into the, uh, so the people online can see you, which means you have to come and stand here. No, but are you following, or, or I can take it over from no, no, I, I'll moderate uh, skillfully, I'm oh, sure. But, uh, but to answer, you should stand here. Then we can call on people. So, okay. yeah. so first question about those AI ethics self-regulation measures, uh, how useful um, they will be um, and uh, how they function. I don't have a very strong faith in self-regulation. And as we see in this country, um, you know, when we defer our... Um, our... Uh, all the decisions to the big tech firms like company like Facebook, right? I mean, you see, you can see how companies behave behind our back, right? I mean, so I wouldn't entirely uh, trust um, the uh, internal self-regulation and the Ministry of uh, Science and Technology is is indeed, you know, uh, doing a lot of things, you know, proposing uh, all this ethics committee and, and trying to formalize, institutionalize some of the, self-regulatory uh, um, uh, self-regulations um, but um, I, I believe that its um, Im impact will be very limited and because these kind of requirements are kind of pro forma it's kind of checking box and to what extent uh, do they really uh, affect uh, compliance um, uh, is a big question mark I mean similarly when you talk to US tech firms like OpenAI and Microsoft they all tell you that how much stringent uh, self-regulatory measures they have undertaken, right? I mean, as how what is the, the large moder uh, content moderation team they have a mass and, um, you know, they also have some red teaming uh, strategies uh, to test um, uh, all sorts of problems with the platforms, but still it's not enough. I mean, we definitely not enough. The, the big the uncertainty is like, you know, we don't know how how much a gap is there between self-regulation and um, you know public regulation, so um, I I I think China needs to do more and cannot in completely entrust farms to uh, regulate themselves. Um, you raised the second question that you raised is truly important, right? I mean, how much competitive advantage does China have um, with its law? I mean, certainly those copyright litigation in the United States against OpenAI against Microsoft. I mean. 
they can potentially change the game for how these companies use copyrighted materials, but it's not going to deter these firms from further developing, uh, you know, uh, generative AI services. And besides, they are very deep pocketed and they will not, you know, go bankrupt because they lose billions of dollars in the lawsuit. Um, so it's not likely to slow them down. But in the Chinese context, I do think the law matters hugely because um, if the law go a restricted way, um, then that means startups, many, many startups, even including the big tech farms will be holding out, especially now the Chinese economy is not doing well. And in the past two, past two years, there was a massive tech crackdown. Right? I mean, so um, the tech sector and the entrepreneurs and the investors, they lack confidence, right? When they need certainty, they need a, a clear guiding signal out there that we know, you know, our efforts and our investment, our hard work will will be respected, will be protected. And there, there was there will be promise and success in this area. So I think that the law do function hugely as an enabler in that sense in facilitating um, China's AI development. And also um, because uh, the law does not restrict, um, you know, it's only targeted at the firms that produce public uh, serving uh, public facing services. So basically if you're a small startup, right? I mean, you are, you're not subject to these rules and you are kind of have plenty of freedom to uh, create uh, uh, generative AI services. So I would see, you know, kind of a massive, um, I, I, there are already a huge proliferation of AI uh, company startups in China, the small and medium sized companies. And this could turn into a highly competitive uh, business and, and competitive advantage for China. So China is this kind of whole of society approach in terms of uh, innovation, like right? uh, the China playbook that I just show you the four levels of control is not very good at, at producing fundamental technology from zero to one, like check GBT. I mean, that's, why ChatGPT didn't emerge in China. But um, the, this whole society approach is relatively good when it comes to one to end, right? I mean, because Chinese companies uh, react very quickly and they're fiercely competitive. They have good technology, good talents, right? I mean, so I do think that, um, I do have confidence that in the next few years, we will see some very fiercely competitive Chinese AI firms emerging on the horizon and on the global stage. Yeah. Thanks. Well, perhaps we can uh, take a couple of questions from the people in the room and then we'll uh, ask for the uh, US Asian Law Institute people to, to read out some of the ones that come from the online side. Uh, yes, and if it, 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 we, I think you're not going to be in the camera shot for those online. And if you want to introduce yourself, do. And if you don't, don't. But uh, go ahead. So I may just escape my name out of the political concern. Uh, thanks for sharing, Professor Zhang. Uh, I think my question is raised from the perspective of the rule of law which I found appalling um, that you would, so I think it's much less mentioned in your discussion. So somewhere in the middle of your presentation, I think you mentioned something that I, as I hear from you, the so-called Chinese characteristic of balance and check, check and balance, which I must confess, I'm at such a disadvantaged position that cannot agree with you at all. So, just to clarify, what do you really mean by check and balance under, I think, the umbrella of more, more, more than half a dozen agencies? So as far as I'm concerned, those are all executive ends implementing the regulation on top of AI, but not regulate the way how regulation of AI could go either way, right? So another way to put the question could be, what might be your political and normative commitment in terms of the way that how those colorful and glorious picture that we have depicted about the um, development of AI, both in China and in global context, lending their convenience and efficiency for the authoritarian regime, manipulating, depriving, and infringing both for the common people, for example, those um, tragedies happened in COVID years, and more specifically, for example, the human rights lawyer, the uh, political dissidents. So I'm not so sure whether that's something intentionally uh, omitted in your discussion, or it could be just back to Professor King, uh, Kingsbury's um, brief comments, part of the risk that you are totally aware of, 
but not been able to elaborate enough uh, in your presentation. And if the latter, here is your chance. Thank you. Look, I mean, an authoritarian government derive in legitimacy mainly from three sources. One is economic growth, right? I mean, you do want the economy to do well. I mean, so people, um, the economy to do well, and when it when now is the economic downturn, you know, the, the leadership um, is under a lot of pressure. The other is social stability, right? I mean, you don't want any threat to the political uh, ruling. And third, you national pride matter hugely. So, um, you know, built into my model of analysis is that, you know, authoritarian government do have multiple sources of legitimacy. That there are things that they need to balance, they need to juggle, right? I mean, that actually is uh, the main gist of the second book I'm talking, uh, I'm going to publish next. Yeah, called high wire, right? I mean, it's kind of you walk in the high wire that you need to tightly balance, uh, you know, different uh, uh, interests and forces from various different places. And uh, we call it to the checks and balance point. What I want to mention is power fragmentation is a hallmark of the Chinese bureaucracy because, um, you know, each agency have their own regulatory function and this regulatory function has been built in that, um, you know, this multiple uh, agenda uh, of the Chinese government. So so some agencies will be in charge of economic growth, some will be in charge of social stability, some in charge, you know, to, to promote national pride, right? I mean, so each of them have their own specific functions and missions, and in that way, kind of check, create some checks and balance uh, between themselves, because these goals can potentially conflict with each other and then can undercut each other. And that's the form of informal checks and balance I'm talking about in the Chinese bureaucracy. And we see this perfectly well in this, um, in this uh, interim measure, right? I mean, in the first draft, it was proposed by one single agency with a very clear object objective for information control. And then um, when the other agencies chime in and contribute it and their involvement significantly water down the rules and so that it creates room for the industry to grow and flourish. Thanks, is there another question? Yes, uh, introduce yourself if you want and not if you don't want, but uh, use the microphone, thanks. Uh, yeah. So thank you for this very wonderful uh, presentation. And I, I love your answer to Professor Tansbury's second question. And I want to ask sort of a follow-up question on that. So um, I'm wondering like whether there's any speci uh, special things about AI's regulation of AI compared to its other regulation of the tech industry in general. So I wonder like if we can predict how it will develop according to your theory of the vol volatile uh, Chinese regulation of tech industry like is there anything special with ai one possibility i can I, I can already imagine is that okay ai's uh chinese ai is already um kind of we have the same starting point with uh everywhere else like uh china chinese regulation is already in uh in conversation with other uh jurisdictions regulations so i guess this may be different from you know the traditional tech industry Look, I mean, I strongly urge you to buy my book, chapter 11 of the new book I'm going to launch next year. We'll have an answer to the question, but I'll give you a little preview to that. So uh, if you think about AI technology, it has very wide application. And this is a technology that can potentially, uh, you know, create disasters, right? If, it, if it's not incorporated and used very properly, right? So if the government does not take a very, a careful and cautious approach in regulating properly, monitoring and regulating its use, um, there is a big question mark about its safety. And um, so that's why now there are policymakers out there expressing concern about what, you know, China's approach give rise to AI disaster. If you think about, you know, the um, in the authoritarian government, even though it's um, it has strong advantage in mass mobilization and can react very quickly when the crisis arises, but it's not good in preventing the crisis to occur in the first place, right? Because of the information lag uh, in the hierarchical system. Um, so I, I I do think that this is something that we should pay attention to. And then when when the crisis arises, it will lead to strong volatility in, in uh, regulatory policy. This is what we see with the consumer tech regulation, and which is something that I elaborate very extensively in my second book on China's tech, uh, big tech regulation. And then we might see the pendulum swim very quickly to the other extreme, right? I mean, and that will lead to all sorts of consequences later down the road. Yeah. 
So it's one of the online questions goes in the same direction. Perhaps you could answer this continuous with this, it's, which is that uh, what would be the approach of companies uh, given both the recent regulatory history, but also given the encouragement in the current, right? will they just grow as fast as they can and become very aggressive in the AI sector? Or will they be a little, uh, will they be trying to judge the future and calculate and it's also especially in relation to the model you've described? No, I don't think they have time to wait, right? I mean, this is a sector that moved very quickly. I mean, from ChatGPT 3.5 to ChatGPT 4, you know, just a few months time, right? I mean, and now Chinese companies really forge ahead with AI applications. I mean, this is an area you need to move fast, right? I mean, that's why the law came out so quickly. The first draft of rule was introduced in April, and then the, fi the finalized version um, was was implemented three months later, right? I mean, the, the, the lightening pace here is not to restrict the firms, it's to liberate them and give them this strong signal that you need to move in and because this is an area you can't wait, right? I mean, so I don't think any technology uh, nowadays um, can afford to wait and, and see. And that's also why I'm concerned, I'm highly concerned about what Europe is doing because with the imposition of a lot of uh, ex ante measures, like particularly a lot of the licensing requirements, I mean, that's going to delay the product launch and that's going to hold back the whole industry altogether. Yes, and of course, the CAC was also very quick in adjusting from their draft to the final version quite, quite significantly. So received comments and changed fast, which is also not not so common in regulators around the world. Yeah, yes. I mean, so don't you think maybe there is something inherent? What's your name, by the way? You're LM or JD student? LLM. Yes. Yeah. Uh, also a research assistant at Guarini. So um, my question is like you just rightly put right now, there's a lot of speed and there's an armrest between companies and between also within government. Do you th don't you think there is something inherently wrong with that, that everyone is just want to be the first at the forefront with regulation, with technology? I mean, without taking into account whether the risk are uh, like, it seems to me like, like the way you're putting China is like two years behind. <laughs> so we need to catch up with that. Don't you think there's something inherently wrong with that? Um. Well, for those that, that are lagging behind, that are catching up, um, they will have a strong desire to, to move very fast and that's understandable. And, um, and, and we kind of know what kind of risks that they might encounter, right? What we are more concerned about are the firms that are at the very cutting edge that are ready pre because you don't know what is next because you're you're venturing into the unknown. I'm talking about the firms like OpenAI, you know, because you are now venturing into the unknown, and then there's speculation when we can achieve super intelligence, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Asimoku, um, a uh, a well-known professor from MIT, uh, recently have a paper with uh, another co-author. I forgot his name. Mm -hmm. It's they build a model to look at you know how um, we should regulate AI. So basically, the idea is that we should move slowly when we don't know the risk, right? Because the, the, the longer you, the, and gradually you start to grow faster because the more information that you absorb along the way, you can update the belief about the potential risk down the road. So you can, so you can just start slowly and gradually uh, uh, grow faster. But that applies to those that are really at the cutting edge. When we're talking about companies like Ch the Chinese firms, which are still catching up phase, um, we kind of know what sorts of risks that, that might encounter if we know. I mean, there's condition assumption that if we know what kind of risk that might generate, um, I, I will be less concerned about that. I'm more concerned about the firms that are venturing into the unknown, which is what is happening in the United States. And currently, there's very lax regulation about that. Well, it's an amazing lot of questions, uh, uh, which is great. So uh, is anyone wanting to address these kind of speed, innovation, risk are there any other questions about that since we're there? Yeah, okay, get, get, get the microphone then. Uh, thank you for the talk, Professor. Learned a lot. Uh, my name is Roshan. I have something on uh, just innovation and the idea of venturing overseas. And I want to take a closer look at exporting Chinese GI systems. Largely because if we look at the draft text of some of the regulations that are being mooted, 
what a GI system may be able to do in China is a little lesser than what it may be able to do elsewhere. Say, for instance, uh, Chinese, uh, China wants you to crack down on false information, wants you to not put up information that is antithetical to the social and economic order, something that I don't understand what that fully means. So do you see China losing out in the race to export its GI models because maybe those models will be able to sig do significantly lesser in terms of innovation? Um, no, I think Chinese companies will take a bifurcated approach. If I aim for a global market, then I will train my data using English source materials, right? I mean, so I use open source English database. Whereas if I aim for, you know, providing service to the Chinese domestic uh, services, then I will train my trained my foundation model using the Chinese source database, right? I mean, so, um, and, and I think the strong advantage that Chinese companies have is that they have very strong talents. Right. I mean, already very good in AI. I mean, think about ByteDance, which is the parent company of TikTok, right? I mean, they they have some technology out there that that's why they can excel and then set so the very strong talent talent pool. And so I do expect them to uh, be a very competitive force uh, in the global uh, uh, competition spheres of AI as well. Yeah, of course, generative AI may be more complex when it's not text, but it's images for example, or image to text and these bifurcation strategies might be a little more challenging. Uh, yes. That's okay, I can hear you. Uh, but the people online can't. So we have oh. to need a red light to go on, otherwise they can't hear. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is, I've noticed that you made a comparative assessment uh, about towards the AI regulation in the European Union, the United States, and China. And my question is, now it looks very different, but uh, in the future, would, what do you think of the, you know, the regulatory models globally? Will they converge as a standard regulatory model? Or there will be three different regulatory model in different jurisdictions. Or China will learn from the European Union or United States and apply one of their regulatory models. Yeah, very good questions. So I, I see very little convergence in the future. It's because um, all this uh, regulatory approach that we are seeing now is not just value driven, but also institutionally, deeply embedded into the institutions, right? I mean, um, it's, um, we, we all know Professor Anu Bracker from Columbia Law School has very influential work on Brussels effects, but I anticipate that Brussels effects probably would not apply to the AI regulatory setting because um, in, because of all sorts of reasons I already elaborated in my, in my talk, right? I mean, so the Chinese government um, has very strong incentive to push ahead this area development. So it's not going to take a very, uh, unlike EU, take a very human-centric, uh, human rights-centric approach with regard to regulation. And by the way, EU has a very strong commitment to regulation because it has a massive EU institution that do nothing but to regulate. I mean, almost nothing. I mean, the European may disagree with me, but they have a very strong, a very, um, a very strong commitment uh, from a lot of the policy entrepreneurs based in Brussels that just think about how to regulate. And, and, the, and the job is not to think about how to grow the company, right? I mean, so you see the, the difference of incentive where the Chinese government is already deeply embedded into the system, right? Regulation is only one level of control, right? It's built into its utility functions. Whereas, uh, you know, EU institutions, which in charge of leading all the regulation, they're not. They're only thinking about regulation, right? And whereas the United States, right? I mean, obviously it's more liberal and market driven, but, U.S. legal institutions are highly decentralized, right? Think about the plaintiff's litigation. And U.S. courts are independent, right? I mean, so you can't tell the court what to do. I mean, even you know, President Biden said he will save our AI industry so we can compete with China. You can't dictate what the court do because the court here are independent. So to the extent they lose a competitive advantage to China because China can better coordinate their legal institutions to, to that extent. But obviously that coordination also comes with downsides, right? Um, yeah, as I said, though, I, I, although one can make the case quite, it's very plausible put that way. Um, I think there's still a question, what's the evidence for it? I, I realize I'm making some very controversial remarks 
just now, so I might want to tone down a bit. No, 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 it's, it's more that, that one, one has to have hypotheses, and this is clearly one which is quite widely shared, but but it's an interest. I think it's still a question. Uh, what, what are the ways of assessing that, and also how does that change over time? I think one uh, issue, because we haven't quite got to it yet, is, well, it, it's quite common now to talk about AI. AI uh, and the Europeans have popularized this by saying we're going to have an AI act so there must be something called AI because we have a good act about it we might uh, but um, it, it, it really when it looks at the Chinese regulation such as what we've seen of it uh, uh, and uh, it, it thinking in other places it's very specific it's, it's to particular kind of use cases public facing things might affect social opinion as one quite quite subset or a particular kind of algorithm against a public recommend algorithms you've got to do something or other or uh, uh, the the uh, uh, maybe some self uh, autonomous vehicles is which is of course highly AI based technology and I'm sure there's things about maps or geospatial but it's very specific uh, and so and I wonder really whether is it it's sort of mis an obfuscation not, not not by you but just by in the field to talk about AI regulation as a topic as opposed to saying with this and that and that and especially when one sees the regulators and supposed apparently going in this much more fragmented way. And also, does that play in a bit to the sense, well, all AI is AI. And so the most extreme imaginable risk, which is very, very bad, of course, must be the risk of all of it. Um, so so, so I, I think it's, it's perhaps a question about that, that phrase. Yeah, I mean, I, I do use, I mean, the, the paper I'm working on do focus very heavily on generative AI because this is an area that experienced explosive growth. Um, but I do, you know, talk about other sectors like facial recognition where I already mentioned in the in the talk where we can you know learn from how China has dealt with the AI technology but um, Professor uh, Kingsbury is definitely right that AI has so many wide applications and um, it's it's hard to you know crystallize everything uh, in uh, in one um, in, in one thesis uh, today and I, by the way I highly recommend his course and he has a number of courses highly popular. It's hard to find a seat uh, in his course on data law. And I, I actually uh, uh, sit in your class, you know that, uh, on AI. Yeah, so I, that's how I, how I learned uh, some of the stuff uh, that I talk about today. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that we need, um, but but if you think about the the, the the AI technology that has the widest application right now, I mean, the, like, you know, generative AI is definitely one key focus area. And so that's why I think it's worth putting a lot of efforts to study how China is going to deal with that. Um, and but but certainly uh, other areas also deserve great attention. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, right at the back. Um, hi, I'm Chris. I'm a one L. Uh, thank you, Professor Zhang, for your sharing. Um, I, my question is about the competition that you talked about between the bureaucracies. I find that really interesting. Um, and what would you characterize a char uh, competition to be? Because now we see like it was supposed to be more strict and then it became more lax. Um, which like uh, bureaucratic actor do you think won out in this scenario? And then it leads me to the uh, other question, which is like, uh, why do you think this is like a, an assurance to the industry? Because like authoritarian, can, uh, like, uh, regimes they send out mixed signals all the time and we've seen in China like they go back and forth um you, there are a couple of questions there uh, embedded in your questions so first of all who wind out in this uh race to regulate AI and we know that seven agencies ultimately were in charge of you know that the names were uh, on the law right I mean they are joint they jointly promulgate the rules but the, the main agency that is really in charge of enforcing the rule is the Cyberspace Administration of China, without doubt, because and also this is the primary agency that set up the, the screening process for who can launch their products um, to the public, right? I mean, um, I see the law as an ultimate product of compromise as everything uh, else in uh, China's bureaucratic politics, right? I mean, um, it's a very common uh, phenomenon. We need to build a consensus among the agencies, right? I mean, otherwise the decision will need to be pushed up to the top. So agencies, they always need to you know, negotiate and reach a compromise. And you can see clearly from the last version of the law where it basically said, you know, each of you guys go back to do and regulate in your own domain, right? I mean, the discretion still lie with the existing 
uh, agency and does not in, uh, interfere with any of the authority. And that's also one of the reasons why the law can get pushed out very quickly, right? Because as, as soon as you get into somebody else's turf, it's going to get into a lot of conflict, a lot of fights. And in fact, this kind of bureaucratic turf, war is usually the single biggest reason that led to legislative delay in China. Yes. We need to give this gentleman a little chance. Oh, he raised hands up. It's a phrase. Phrase is a bias because my angle of vision is to, uh, across you. Yeah. yeah. Um, hi, Professor Zhang. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm Jean, and I'm a 2L. Um, I had a question about your final message, which had to do with um, international communities engagement with China. Um, so how, like, how do you think? that process should play out in terms of standard setting? So how can other international actors engage with China in this process? And how receptive or cooperative do you um, expect China to be um, in this arena? Well, I mean, certainly China has strong commercial incentive to engage in standard setting, right? I mean, because who win out in standard settings, I mean, means a lot, right? I mean, as the quote say here, right? I mean, the first rate company, you produce standard. And that's how Huawei came out, you know, first in the in the 5G because usually it has to be the companies that stand at the cutting edge of the technology be able to formulate standards. And China, you know, in regard to facial recognition technology, it's really standard, it's a pioneer. So it, it could have played an influential role in the standard settings in, with that, that regard. But with Chuck GBT, I would see China can, because it's lagging behind. So it will let, you know, less, um, you know, influence uh, in that regard. Right, but certainly China has strong commercial incentive to do that. Um, um, but beyond that, I do think the international community need to engage with China more because there's so many concerns about safety and security of AI products. And um, but because China is excluded from those rich clubs like G20, G7, and OECD, and all these clubs that building very strong AI community. Right, I mean there is now a big debate in November. This year, uh, UK is going to host a summit, whether we should engage China or not, right? I mean, I, I was wondering, should that a question be asked, right? I mean, China is the biggest play, one of the biggest player. If you don't engage it, it doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, also, if you think about, you know, the potential risk not engaging China, um, then uh, it make all the sense that uh, we, we need to engage China on the table um, to discuss um, all, all these very important issues. Uh, so I, I do really, you know, I know I am a lonely voice out there, but I do hope there will be stronger international commitment to do this. And I think the people who are at the technological frontier, they do agree with me because they are concerned about super intelligence. They're thinking about, you know, um, alignment issues with the AI, you know, when it, it can surpass human intelligence. So if we are facing existential threat, I mean, this kind of geopolitics and the geopolitical tensions like becomes moot or, or minor, right? I mean, um, okay, uh, my name is Mike, I'm a 1L, thank, thank you for the uh, shout out. Um, this question is maybe because a little bit coming from the fact that formerly I was in a more technical role, um, but to this point about disaggregating types of AI, uh, historically, I think like China was known for having a much bigger competitive advantage in things like computer vision, maybe robotics as well, yeah. um, which were both in, in part driven by the fact that those seem much more useful for manufacturing than something like a text-based chatbot, which seems to align more with like an, an information services-based economy. Um, when you talk about the coordinating functions of law, I wonder, are you concerned at all about like regulators responding and coordinating to shift attention um, in a way that China actually ends up losing a comparative edge in some other part of AI. Um, is, is that a concern at all? Um, how does that factor into like international collaboration on these sorts of issues? Um, this is just to the, I guess, the broader point of like different types of AI have different inputs and needs. Yeah, excellent question. So, I mean, one, I mean, there are advantage with this kind of mass mobilization approach, the whole, whole of society approach where you put in all the efforts, all the energy, all the resources into certain type of technology. And you see that not just in AI race, but also in Olympics, right? I mean, in, in, in games, right? Where China really doubled down on a few areas like swimming, uh, you know, diving, you know, I mean, so, um, and 
This comes down to the question of misallocation. Would the government be betting on the wrong technology to excel? But I don't think that they um, they make a wrong bet with generative AI because this is a technology so revolutionary, so explosive, and has such a wide application. This is just something that China cannot afford to let behind. But you do raise a good point. Like, would they kind of overdo it, right? To the to that extent that they didn't elect other areas which equally should deserve more attention and deserve more resources. And that's a very good question to ask and, and remains uh, to be seen, yeah. So, and I think this goes also to the, the, the idea of standards and standardization is really very different in different things. There are some hardware standards, software connected to hardware, you could imagine lots of standards and dropability. Not so clear that some parts of AI development are gonna be so much driven by just all, that kind of standards uh, as opposed to maybe safety scale or or some kind of control mechanism an off switch or uh testing all those kind of things which may be a slightly different project um so i i we're almost at the end i'd like to ask just one more question uh, well, here. We have a one question. uh, uh well okay but i, I want to say something so, okay i'll give you the chance to... uh, no, uh, so, so uh but why don't you do yours and then i'll add mine and she can answer as she sees yeah all right uh thanks professor Zhang. my name is billy and um, during the middle part of your presentation, you mentioned something about the scarcity of data for the Chinese AI company to develop for reasons we know. The, some of those are the censorship, which doesn't really have a law for, or uh, the, the movement for release of inf government information, like release of court record or government minutes, which kind of just stopped when the COVID hits. So do you by any chance see any like, movement in making progress on that part to push for like more available data domestically um, either in the in the administrative part or just moving forward with uh, with complying with the release of information something like that oh um i am not uh, sure how the government disclosure uh process uh might contribute to um providing more data sources to um, to the training of large language models. But I do know that um, this is exactly what the Chinese government is doing, is calling for uh, the creation of a lot of these kind of data alliance uh, uh, between both uh, public and non-public, uh, like private institutions, that they can contribute to data sources. And China is also uh, building a lot of data exchange center and a government is turning our policies to uh, facilitate data exchange all over in different cities. Um, so there are a lot of things that we are seeing happening, but to what extent does it really achieve the impact remains to be seen. Uh, but I think, um, but at least those data database, those um, that, that will be established by those data alliance firms, I think that will be very useful. And already seeing, we're already starting to see reports saying that how how they, how useful they have been in, in training the Chinese language, large language models. And also I think one easy thing that they can potentially push is to, to, uh, to create more open source data, right? I mean, because that was one of the biggest reasons why China lacks um, yeah, uh, good, good quality data is because a lot of the data are owned by the big tech companies. They're not open source, right? I mean, so, so um, if the government can push more open source data, but that was also a controversial issue, right? I mean, then, then potentially we might, might see more uh, potential growth, yeah. Well, I think we've reached the end of our time. I won't ask my question, but I'd like to uh, th thank you very much for a wonderful talk and uh, you're re really engaging with everybody and uh, ask uh, Catherine Long to say the final word. Thank you both. That was a really fantastic discussion and uh, learned a huge amount and we look forward to seeing the book in the spring. Um, so just a final advertisement from us. On Monday at four o'clock, we are going to be hosting a talk by the former president of the Republic of China, Taiwan, uh, Mind Joe. That will be in Lipton Hall, and all of you are very uh, welcome. I hope to see some of you there. Thank you. <laughs>